Good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome to UC San Diego and welcome to Women in Leadership. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pradeep Khosla. I'm the Chancellor of UC San Diego and it's a great honor. Thank you. These are actually my students, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> well, this is an amazing day. So today, the United States Postal Service unveiled a stamp honoring Sally Ride. The first, thank you. Sally Wright, the first American woman to fly into space, and also who happens to be one of her esteemed faculty members, happened to be one of her esteemed faculty members. So they chose Sally because she inspired the nation as a pioneering astronaut, a brilliant physicist, and a dedicated educator. Sally is only the second astronaut to be commemorated on a USPS stamp, and she is in good company being immortalized forever on the forever stamp. This year, the USPS, the US Post Office, Postal Service, is also honoring icons Lena Horn and John Lennon with their own stamps. So we at UC San Diego are very proud that Sally Ride was a professor of physics here, and she was a professor for nearly two decades. Her legacy lives on here in so many different ways, through the life she touched, the minds she motivated, the educational programs she created, the books she wrote, and the brand new US Navy research vessel that we operate in her honor on behalf of the US Navy. And thank you. And the Sally Wright Graduate Fellowship at UC San Diego inspires future generations of boundary-breaking physicists to contribute to the public good. So tonight, our celebration of Sal Sally Wright continues. Sally's life partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy. Tam, there where she is. Where is she? There she is. There she is. Say hi to her. So Tam knew she wanted to mark this occasion in a way that reflected what Sally really cared about, and which was science, research, education, and equality. And thus, and then I learned earlier, athletics. So let me just add to that. Otherwise, Ms. King would be upset with me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that reminder. <laughs> and thus, the Women in Leadership Symposium was born. So thank you, Tam, for all of your work in bringing today's events to our campus. As well as, Sally, as well as bringing Sally Wright Science to our campus. UC San Diego is committed to providing education and research opportunities to young, bright minds from all backgrounds, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds, so that our programs offered by Sally Wright Science are a natural fit here at our university. We are proud to continue Sally Wright's legacy in so many different ways and to have so many of our dear friends here with us today, women who have blazed new trails and created a better future and role models for all of us. These women include Billie Jean King. Thank you. Ellen Ochoa. Condoleezza Rice, and Lynn Schur. And tonight, led by our moderator, Lynn Schur, they will share their breakthrough experiences and insights, and I'm, and I'm certain that they will leave us as inspired as we, as we want to be. So having said that, welcome, everybody, and thank you. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Simmons. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor of the University, and I'm also a theoretical physicist. 
I'm really delighted to be here on this auspicious occasion to honor someone who is one of my personal heroes, one of the few women physicists who were available to be role models to women of my generation early in our careers. I was a physics undergraduate in 1983 when Sally Ride first leapt into space and into the national imagination. And even now, decades later, women, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and members of the LGBTQ community are still underrepresented or relatively invisible within, uh, within STEM fields, and especially in STEM leadership positions. And this creates challenges for us all. Just think of all the wasted talent and the lost perspectives and knowledge. And it also, in some ways, stifles our vision of what an equitable and diverse and an inclusive world really could be like. It also creates a self-perpetuating situation in STEM. People view the status quo as what should be rather than what happens to be the case. And then society starts telling girls and others not to pursue certain fields because they're not suitable for them to pursue. And then when there are a few of us in a field, isolation can make it harder to be productive and harder to advance in the field. And so the cycle continues. And it's self-perpetuating in leadership as well. Implicit bias of this same kind leads people to assume that women can't make the leap into leadership as easily as men can. And so sometimes men who are in positions of power may not tend to mentor women or pick them as leaders. And the women at the same time may not think that they have the potential to be leaders. And women trying to simply survive in male-dominated fields may not even have the mental space to look around and lift their heads and think of what else they could be doing. So how do we change that equation? Well, we need to make women and members of other traditionally underrepresented groups in higher education visible to each other and to students. And so this is part of why it was so incredibly important that Sally Ride was a professor of physics here at UC San Diego. We have to advocate for women's history and women's ideas to be part of the academy, not just a, an add-on to the curriculum, but part of the mainstream curriculum that everybody knows about. And so this is why it's crucial that we keep Sally Ride's story and her legacy visible for future generations. And we have to identify those diverse future scientists and engineers and leaders and seek them out and support them. We need to let them know that we see their potential. We need to ask them about their aspirations and then help them to meet their dreams. We need to help them explore science and leadership through richly engaging and challenging experiences alongside equally enthusiastic peers. And this is exactly what Sally Ride Science is doing for the next generation of scientists and leaders. Wonderf what a wonderful legacy for Sally Ride. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> that was a great talk. <laughs> um, I'm Tam O'Shaughnessy. I am co-founder of Sally Ride Science. And now I am executive director of Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego. <laughs> um, and, and also, uh, I was very proud to be Sally's partner for a long time. You can clap. <laughs> Please clap. <laughs> um, as you know, a short while ago, the United States Postal Service unveiled. We had a wonderful dedication ceremony. And that stamp is, uh, I just think it's drop dead gorgeous. It, it captures Sally's uh, essence, her, her cool demeanor, her warm smile and especially that, uh, that sparkle in her eyes. It's really uh, gorgeous. You know, it, and it's really, it's a shame that, Ch that Sally cannot be here with us tonight because she collected stamps from the time she was nine and she, she would be so uh, honored. Um, after retiring from NASA, uh, Sally was a physics pr professor here, as Pradeep said. 
And uh, today, UC San Diego carries on her legacy um, through Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego. Uh, Sally and I, along with our three dear friends who are here today in the audience, uh, Karen Flammer. Karen, where are you? <laughs> Dr. Karen Flammer. Uh, Terry McEntee. You can't see where you are. And, and Alan Lopes. We started a company. Uh, we came up with the idea for the company in the year 2000. None of us knew what we were doing, so we did everything by the seat of our pants. But we really, what we did is to uh, sort of dream of what we wanted to have available for young people, boys and girls. Um, but of course, an emphasis on girls because that's what's really needed. And, uh, you know, we're still going strong today, 18 years later. Um, so we founded Sally Ride Science in, in 2001. We got our, uh, our first and last round of uh, angel funding. Um, and our goal was to encourage girls and boys of all backgrounds to become literate in math and science and technology, and also to envision themselves as scientists and engineers. Since 2015, the company has been a thriving part. We're now a nonprofit organization, which really fits our mission beautifully. Uh, but we're a thriving part of UCSD Extension, and it's a match made in heaven. Um, we have uh, started new programs, including our Summer Junior Academy and free STEAM workshops. We, we added the A for the importance of art design in all areas of uh, science and technology, engineering. So we're offering free STEAM workshops at library branches throughout uh, San Diego, and that's a, a very exciting program uh, spearheaded by Eta Beta, uh, who's part, yes. Um, as Pradeep said, Chancellor Kosla, uh, Sally was a physicist. Clearly, she was a space pioneer. Uh, she was an author. And she also was a passionate advocate for equitable and excellent education in all areas, including uh, science and math. And in all these areas of her life, she was a leader. Tonight's panelists and moderator were all dear friends to Sally, and they're my close friends as well. They are remarkable leaders who have shattered barriers and led the way for women in their, their own fields. The four of them all have fascinating stories to share about what it means to be a trailblazing woman leader. They also are uniquely qualified to offer a vision for how women can help lead our nation to a better future. <laughs> so tonight, we're going to celebrate women in leadership. And before we get started, though, we're going to take a look at a video created by the United States Postal Service that is a tribute to Sally. Thank you. Sally was born at a time when outer space was science fiction and women's rights were practically non-existent. While she was playing tennis in college, she was studying science. The thing is, she never imagined being an astronaut. She saw an advertisement that NASA was soliciting women to be astronauts and she thought, I could do that. I watched as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon and I was nine years old. But the year I graduated from high school uh, was the year that Sally Ride, among the total of six women, were selected that year. 1977, NASA selected 35 new astronauts to fly the space shuttle. She was one, I was another. I was tremendously interested in and proud of Sally Ride and the five other women who were selected to be astronauts in 1978. And to me, Sally and the others were beacons that our generation of girls was coming of age. My first assignment was to 
do a story on the so-called new breed of astronauts. And the new breed meant that for the first time, NASA was taking women, people of color, non-military scientists, people who were going to go to do something on the shuttle, not necessarily fly it or land it. The seventh flight of the space shuttle was on board Challenger. There were five crew members. Bob Crippen was the commander, and then four of us who were in the new shuttle group. Uh, we called ourselves TFNG, 35 new guys. The American people loved the fact that a woman was finally going to fly in space. I was actually at Sally Ride's launch in 1983. I was on a family vacation when I was 12 years old, and we went to the Kennedy Space Center and watched the first American woman go into space. For me, that changed my dream of being an astronaut into something more of a goal, something that seemed much more achievable to me. So it was very critical, I think, in my life to inspire me, let me know that other women could do this job. Ultimately, I think Sally Ride thought of herself primarily as an educator. She spent more time as an educator, an author, the force behind Sally Ride Science than she did as an astronaut. She loved students. She loved working both formally in the classroom and being out in, with the students and in, in, uh, having coffee and just trying to get to know the people that she wanted to inspire. Sally Ride Science was Sally Ride's way of saying, I did this, so can you, and we need you. Not just that she was an astronaut, a physicist, and an influential icon as a woman. The forever stamp is very important because it really showcases that Sally was an inspiration for all women to go into the sciences. It's a tremendous honor for Sally Ride to be featured on a U.S. postal stamp. And seeing that megawatt grin on stamps all over this country, I think, is a great way to remember that. Good evening, so nice to see you all here. Uh, I'm Lynn Scherr, same person you just saw up there. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and as I said there, um, I did have the great good fortune to meet Sally in 1981 when I was assigned by ABC News uh, to the team covering the new space shuttle. So my first interview at the Johnson Space Center in Houston was with that so-called new breed of astronauts. And um, these, these unusual people coming to join the right stuff military guys to explore space. Sally was one of the, we said to NASA, uh, we need, I don't know what the number was, five or six or seven people so I can do an interview. Sally was one of the newbies that NASA offered up for my interview. And I was immediately taken with her candor, with her charm, and with her unabashed feminism. And she acknowledged unequivocally that the ongoing women's movement had made her selection possible, the selection of all six women. We became friends immediately, during and long after her historic shuttle career. And while it was a bittersweet assignment, I wrote her biography after she died in 2012. Like everyone who knew her, I still miss her madly. I miss her humor. I miss her optimism. She was just so much fun. But she still has so much to teach us. Think of this. That bold young woman on the postage stamp, the one whose grin once lit up the skies, whose mischievous nature charmed us all, who convinced several generations that they too could do anything, that woman would be in the granny generation today. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's hear it for the granny generation. <laughs> and by the way, for Sally's mom, who is of course a granny as well, and Sally's sister. As we celebrate what would have been Sally's post-Medicare birthday, <laughs> I think it's important to remember that she still would be an absolutely vital role model with critical lessons for today's newly emerging leaders. Her beaming face on a stamp, whether it's actually used to mail something or perhaps just to collect, just saying, is the perfect bridge between the extraordinary achievements of the recent past 
and the lofty goals of the Me Too and the Never Again era. <laughs> Sally would have understood it all. When she was selected in 1981 as America's first female astronaut to fly, I'm sorry, she was selected in 1982, she mused publicly, and I quote, maybe it's too bad that our society isn't further along and that this is such a big deal. <laughs> yeah, right. And right before she took off in June of 1983, she told me that yes, she did feel under pressure, that she felt under pressure not to mess up. Sally never elaborated, she rarely did, but I took it to mean that she didn't want to mess up for several reasons. She didn't want to mess up for space exploration because she really believed in its goals. She didn't want to mess up for NASA because she deeply respected the mission. She didn't want to mess up for her crew because she always was a team player. But mostly, that she didn't want to mess up for other women because she understood that she was all of our representative on that very first critical flight. Sally did not mess up. She rarely, if ever, did that either. She proved that you don't need the right plumbing to have the right stuff. And the rest of her life, from flying to managing to investigating at NASA, from teaching here at UCSD to creating Sally Ride Science with Tam and Terry and Karen and Alan, became a checklist of how to succeed in a world often set against you, usually with wry wit. When asked repeatedly by college audiences what advice she would give to other aspiring astronauts, Sally, who'd learned that NASA was seeking uh, women and minorities from reading the Stanford Daily, would say, read your college newspaper. <laughs> at one pre-flight NASA press conference when a clueless reporter asked her whether at times of stress she might weep, Sally turned to her crewmate Rick Halk, whom you saw in the video, um, uh, and she said, bemused, why doesn't anyone ever ask Rick these questions? <laughs> after her second flight, when president after president asked what it would take to get Sally to run NASA, the one-time tennis champ with an office overlooking the Pacific Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean quipped, oh yeah, if they'd move it to California. <laughs> Little girls around the country have been dressing up in Sally Ride flight suits for decades. Now even their grandkids are assured a chance to remember and honor this pioneer, as the new stamp says in the corner, forever. And there's no better way to celebrate her legacy than to discuss the issue that so consumed and defined her life and that was leadership, specifically women in leadership. And no better way to do so than with the extraordinary leaders who were also Sally's good friends and who are here to share their wisdom with you. You know them by name and you can read all their specifics about them in your programs. Let me just give a very brief introduction as we get started. Some of us were watching and cheering live on television that night in 1973 <laughs> when Billie Jean King won the then, then latest Battle of the Sexes. I hope the rest of you saw the movie. Billie Jean, already a hero for the young aspiring tennis player named Sally Ride, became a champion for all of us when she, when she crushed Bobby Riggs and showed us the future. Billie has never stopped. Now, not in the movie, in real life, Billie Jean said to the press afterwards, I think this match will do great things for women's tennis. <laughs> Entirely underestimating her impact on this world. In fact, Billie has helped change everything. Please welcome tennis ace, gender equalizer, successful businesswoman, and all around cool superstar, Billie Jean King. <laughs> Huh? Thank you. 
When I interviewed Ellen Ochoa for my biography of Sally, she told me that as a graduate student in electrical engineering at Stanford with a BS in physics, seeing Sally's first flight was life-changing. I'd started thinking about being an astronaut, Ellen said, and seeing another woman who had a physics degree like I did made me think I wasn't completely crazy to apply. Crazy like a fox. Ellen became the first Hispanic woman in the world to fly, and just this month has retire, is about to retire from being the director of the Johnson Space Center in Houston. After managing more than 3,000 employees with a budget of some $4.5 billion, she says, she says, she's going to Idaho to play the flute. We'll see. <laughs> Please welcome Ellen Ochoa. <laughs> Of course, you know Condoleezza Rice as our former Secretary of State, the first African-American, the second woman to hold the position. Sally knew her as a fellow at the Stanford Think Tank, where in 1987, they studied how to keep the world from blowing itself up. <laughs> Condi, which she insists I call her, and probably you too, had some academic anxiety over meeting Sally. And, she told me, I thought to myself, what am I gonna say when I meet her? And then I blurted out, What's it like to go into space? <laughs> the women became friends immediately. They spent hours watching football games on TV in Rice's apartment because her TV set was larger. <laughs> Condi says she once told Sally that um, she, Sally, ought to run for office, and Sally told her she was out of her mind. Mm -hmm. And then Sally told Condi she ought to run for office. <laughs> Same answer. Please share a laugh and give a big welcome to Condoleezza Rice.